one of the most important and overlooked figures of the 20th century, composer, arranger, band leader, innovator, war hero, organizer, advocate for the cause of equality of African Americans, James Reese Europe. He was a major figure in New York's African American musical community in the years leading up to World War I. Historical literature seems to have given Europe less credit than he deserves regarding his contributions to the development of black music. Other early 20th century notables such as Ford Dabney, Scott Joplin, Will Cook, U.B. Blake, Noble Sissel, and W.C. Handy have received greater prominence in the historical record. Many archivists of African American history have regarded Europe's promoting a positive African American agenda as suspect, perhaps because he often voiced opinions which echoed Booker T. Washington's call for accommodation. In a widely acclaimed speech, which was called the Atlanta Compromise, Washington called for patience, accommodation, and self-help. He played down political rights and emphasized vocational education as the best way for African Americans to advance. However, given what is known of Reese's activities in African American interests in other ways, such as his efforts to promote African American concert music, being a major player in the creation of the Harlem Settlement Music Association and founding the Tempo and Clef Clubs, he very well may have considered himself as one of W.E.B. Du Bois's talented tenth. The talented tenth was a concept of Du Bois which emphasized the necessity for higher education to develop the leadership capacity among the most able 10% of black Americans. He feared the ideas espoused by Booker T. Washington in the Atlanta Compromise overemphasized the importance of industrial training, which would confine blacks permanently to the ranks of second-class citizenship. In 1910, he founded the Clef Club, which established its own orchestra and chorus, but also served as a union and contracting agency for black musicians, with as many as 200 men on this roster. He was known as a tireless innovator for his composition and orchestration, but also for his natural leadership and organizational ability. His music borrowed from and built upon African American folk music, incorporating elements of ragtime and other contemporary styles. His name is often mentioned when people discuss the beginnings of jazz. He firmly believed that black musicians did not need to play or imitate white music, though they respected any music of quality. Instead, they had their own musical tradition and their own musical style, which people of all races would want to hear. His orchestra, sometimes as large as 125 musicians, included banjos and mandolins and presented music exclusively by black composers. In May 1912, the Clef Club Orchestra performed the Concert of Negro Music in Carnegie Hall. It was a resounding success. The Clef Club was instrumental in changing attitudes towards black musicians, negotiating better salaries and working conditions for its members. The Clef Club Orchestra played in Carnegie Hall again in 1913 and 1914. As their reputation grew, it became quite enviable for New York's high society to boast a genuine Clef Club Orchestra at a social event. At the start of World War I, James enlisted as a private in the 15th Infantry, a black New York National Guard unit. He was commissioned as a lieutenant, and the 15th Infantry was later redesignated the 369th Infantry. The French later nicknamed that unit the Harlem Hellfighters, after the black soldiers' ferocious fighting skills were recognized. James was asked to form a military band as part of the combat unit. 
When his unit arrived in France on New Year's Day, 1918, it was the first African-American combat unit to set foot on French soil. The Harlem Hellfighters would serve 191 days in combat, longer than any U.S. unit, and reportedly never lost an inch of ground. After risking his life for his country, James Europe and his band returned triumphantly to New York on February 12, 1919, and soon began a tour of American cities. He also spent a lot of time in the recording studio, working with his now internationally acclaimed orchestra, cranking out hit records. His recordings were among some of the most popular songs recorded during this time. In addition to his busy recording schedule, he was busy booking a triumphant homecoming tour for the 369th New York Regimental Band. It was during this time that his untimely death happened. He died on May 9, 1919. New York City honored him with a public funeral, another first for a black American. James Reese Europe was buried with full military honors in Arlington National Cemetery. Yubi Blake, African-American composer, lyricist, pianist, and friend of James, later said of him, he was our benefactor and inspiration. Even more, he was the Martin Luther King of music. His musical legacy has often been overlooked, but will never be forgotten. Good evening. Good evening. James Vissier, as we prepared for this uh, presentation, as Ms. Jones said, uh, got a chance to learn a lot about this unique individual and found out, even though he is one of the most unrecognized musicians in the history of music, he is also one of the most important. He was a man of great intellect, great passion, great understanding, and a love for music and people. A man of great accomplishments. He was considered and credited with being the first to introduce the European continent with African-American music, particularly jazz, early blues, and ragtime. His orchestra was the first ever recorded by a major record label. His music was so influential that it helped create new dances, including the Foxtrot and Ball and the Jack. He founded the Clef Club in 1910 to address issues specific to African-American composers and writers. James East Europe is the man that the great noble Cecil called the Martin Luther King of Music. He was born in Mobile, Alabama in 1880. Nine years later, his family moved to Washington, D.C. He lived right down the street from the great John Philip Sousa, the March King. John Philip Sousa, he had a long-running relationship with the black community in Washington, D.C. He, along with many of his musicians, taught the kids in the neighborhood, gave them free music lessons. One of those kids was a very young James Reese Europe. And you can even hear the influence of his writing in some of Reese's music, which we'll hear this evening as well. In 1910, he moved to New York, where he immediately got involved in the music scene there particularly the music theater scene. He also came in contact with other great musicians at that time, particularly, again, Noble Sissel, Yubi Blake, Marion Will Clark, and others at that time. He also formed, a few years later, the Clef Club, which was a very, very instrumental, important organization in changing attitudes towards black musicians and helping them to get jobs and getting paid a proper scale in New York. He was known as a tireless creator, innovator, musician, orchestrator. He firmly believed that black musicians did not need to play or imitate white music, though they respected any music of quality. Instead, they had their own musical tradition and their own musical style, which people of all races would want to hear. His orchestra, sometime as large as 125 musicians, included banjos, mandolins, and presented music exclusively by black composers. In May of 1912, 
The Clef Club Orchestra performed a concert of Negro music at Carnegie Hall. It was a resounding success. The Clef Club was instrumental in changing attitudes towards black musicians, negotiating better salaries and working conditions for its members. As their reputation grew, it became quite enviable for the New York High Society to boast a genuine Clef Club Orchestra at a social event. Here's a march that James V. Europe composed in honor of the Clef Club, entitled Clef Club Grand March. Racial stereotypes continued to be broken by James Reese Europe, especially in 1913 when he met a very, very popular dance couple, Vernon and Irene Castle, who were international dance stars. They met him at a society event, and they loved the music they had heard. The syncopation, the melodies they had never heard before, excited them so much they wanted him to be their musical director. So they hired him, which was unheard of at that time in history. They were asked to travel all over the world dancing, in the most private, if you will, society parties in New York. They had such a relationship with Mr. Europe that many engagements they refused to accept because the folks who were hiring them did not want African-American musicians at the engagements. So they turned down many jobs as well. But he went on to help create a big stir around the world as their musical director and writing music for them as well. Uh, the next piece you will hear is a piece that he wrote for them. The Castle House Rag. <laughs>
In the summer of 1916, a year before the United States ended the First World War, um, a new all-black regiment of the New York National Guard was formed. And that September, James Reese Europe was commissioned as a lieutenant in the 15th Regiment. James Europe had developed important associations, we say, with other musicians, particularly musicians of note, Uri Blake and the other writers in New York. And he had expressed many times to his close friend at that time, Lupo Sissel, that, quote, he felt the need for an organization of Negro men that could bring together all classes of men for a common good. Sissel enlisted shortly after James Europe, and their commanding officer, recognizing the importance of music and parades in establishing morale, asked Europe to organize and develop the best band in the United States. And he did so, going as far as Puerto Rico to find the musicians that he wanted. Jim Europe's growing sense of patriotism was especially remarkable. It was determined that the group should be sent to France to complete their training. Many African Americans were among the thousands of soldiers that landed in France. Among that group was the 15th Infantry Regiment, who were led by Lieutenant James Reese Europe. Many times, in fact, all the times, the African Americans were assigned to menial tasks, cleaning the trains and building construction sites. They were not allowed to fight next to their white American soldiers. The French welcomed them not only as musicians, but as soldiers and as men. When they stepped off the boat in France, January 1st, 1918, they played the national anthem, the French national anthem, La Marseille. And at first, the French didn't recognize the song. And once they recognized it, they went wild. They loved it because they had never heard, again, music played in that style and something that they recognized, their own national anthem. After they performed that, they went to the band and asked if they could see their instruments because they thought they were trick instruments. They couldn't believe that the music was being produced out of regular instruments. Um, please give a listen to La Marseille.
I can imagine that was quite a shock for the French to hear that. <laughs> Eventually, the reputation of Europe's band got out and the orders followed from General Pershing to have them transferred to a location where they could entertain soldiers and boost their morale. In the period that followed, Europe and his band played numerous places in the region with crowds going wild with his new style of music. One of the most popular and requested songs was a piece written by the great W.C. Handy, The Great Memphis Blues. which had been rarely heard up to this point. Um, it would continue to develop later on, of course, with the great uh, innovators such as Louis Armstrong, and as the music continued to grow. But uh, at this time, it was unheard of, even within an orchestral setting. So again, he was constantly pushing the envelope and developing more and new creative musical styles. Eventually, the soldiers were able to fight France. The 15th Regiment were renamed the 369th Regiment. That particular regiment was given the name Hellfighters, allegedly by the Germans, because of their ferocious fighting style. Another first 
Lieutenant Europe was the first African-American officer to lead his troops into combat during the First World War. Historians of the regiment say that the troops spent 191 days on the front, more than any other Americans. The soldiers went on to serve with such honor and distinction that every one of them received France's highest award for bravery in the battle, the Croix de Guerre. Europe's combat duties had included going out on patrol, an experience that inspired lyrics for a song called On Patrol in No Man's Land, which he put together while he was in the hospital after being in a gas attack. But nothing is romanticized in these lyrics. It gives the listener some idea what it means to be in no man's land. And that was in a war considered the distance, the section of land between the two combating uh, armies. In the lyrics, an officer leads men over the top of the trenches for patrol, warns them of danger from German weapons, and gives orders to attack. In the song, you hear how the musicians are also creating sound effects of the war. This was a, a song, again, written by James Reese Europe while in the hospital. Lieutenant James Reese Europe wrote the song On Patrol in No Man's Land. At the end of the war, the 369th sailed home as heroes, and Lieutenant Europe's band marched up Fifth Avenue and then through Harlem in a victory parade to the cheers of an estimated one million New Yorkers. In an editorial that ran in the May 1919 edition of the Crisis Magazine, the official publication of the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote, we return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. It was Du Bois' hope that the valiant service of the African-American men towards the war effort abroad would be rewarded with the civil rights benefits at home. That hope white America would change its ways and start treating black people equitably. But that did not happen. What did happen was the Red Summer of 1919. The Red Summer of 1919 was a series of race riots by whites attacking African-American families in their homes and their communities. One theory for the violence was many whites felt that although African-American soldiers had been treated fairly and with dignity in France, they were going to change nothing here at home in their treatment of blacks here in America. 
One of the most popular songs of the post-World War I era is a song entitled, How You Gonna Keep Them Down on the Farm, after they'd seen Perry. It was a big hit record recorded by James Reese's orchestra. For many Americans, it was a song that had a bit of a double entendre. For some whites, particularly those of the rural South, the song echoed their sentiments about their sons, fathers, and brothers returning home from the war. Although while they were in battle in France, they were exposed to a different culture style of living. After that experience of making the transition back to the lifestyle they were accustomed to at home would be difficult to say the least. For African Americans, the song presented a rhetorical question and a proclamation. I'm not coming back to freedom being denied at home after having fought for freedom abroad. The song, How You Gonna Keep Them Down on the Farm After They've Seen Perry. James Reese Europe spent a lot of time in the recording studio working with his now internationally acclaimed orchestra, cranking out the hits. His recordings were among some of the most popular songs recorded at this time. His recordings actually predated what was called race records, which really came into being in 1920. Those were records which were created and marketed to exclusively black people. So in essence, his music was being bought by everybody. He was very popular. He recorded two dozen recordings for a major record label, which advertised Europe as the Jazz King. One of his most popular records was named after a dance craze that was sweeping the country called Ball in the Jack. Interestingly, the um, historians think that the term came from the Gandhi dancers. Uh, Gandhi dancers were those men who laid the tracks for railroad trains. And the term ball and jack he had to do with the speed of a train. The locomotive, locomotives, when they were coming, they would pull, make the noise with their whistles. Um, I mean, they were going all out. That was called ball and the jack. And um, got it. interestingly, my grandfather was a Gandhi dancer, so I never had a chance to ask him about that, but that was where they think the term came from. This also was a big hit for James East Europe. And I'd like to do it for you right now. Ball in the Jack.
right, then you sway them to the left, then you sway them to the right. Stamp around the floor, kind of nice and light. Then you twist around, twist around with all of your might. Put your loving arms straight out in space, then you do the Eva Rock with style and grace. Swing your foot way around and bring it back. And that's what I call moving the jack. First you put your two knees close up tight, then you sway them to the left, then you sway them to the right. Step around the floor, kind of nice and light. Then you twist around, twist around with all of your mind. Put your loving arms straight out in space, then you do the Eva Rock with style and grace. Swing your foot way around and bring it back, and that's what I call falling a jack. Another hit record by James Isher was a song written in 1915 by an African-American songwriter from Chicago, Shelton Brooks. The area on the south side of Chicago, Chicago primarily um, populated by African-Americans, now commonly called Bronzeville. Back in the day, they called it Dark Town. Strutters. Uh, today, I call it swag. <laughs> Ball. Uh, it was a party, but to be very, very honest, in the day terms again, it would be what we call a player's ball. This was a song that was celebrating the community back in the 1920s, and it was for the everyday people, if you will, the, um, the street people. And, and they had a very, very good time. They would get dressed up. They would come out, have a good time at the party. And um, therefore, the title was called The uh, Dark Town Strutters Ball. I'll be down to get you in a taxi, honey. Better be ready by half past eight. I mean, don't be late. Starts playing. Remember when you get there, honey? Dance all over the floor. Dance all over my shoes. When the band plays the Jelly Rose Blues, set them all the light at the downtown Strutters Ball. Come and give me in your push cart, honey. Better be ready by half past eight. I mean, don't be.
is music? Europe brought ragtime into mainstream society and elevated African American music into an accepted art form. He was a household name in New York's music world and on the dance scene nationwide. In the month of March 1919, Europe and his orchestra embarked on a tour of American cities. On May 10th, during the intermission of a concert date in Boston, Massachusetts, an emotionally disturbed band member, one of the drummers in the orchestra, became angered with Mr. Europe and attacked him with a small pin knife. Mr. Europe did not survive the attack. He bled to death. He died in Boston on May 10th, 1919. He was only 38 years old. He was given a public funeral in New York City, another first for an African American, and was buried with military honors in Arlington National Cemetery. The impact of James Reese Europe on American music cannot be overestimated. He shaped not only the music of his own time, but of future generations as well. The young people, the young people you see before you today are a testament to his legacy. And the music continues. Thank you.